Okay, so um, I hope I, I hope everybody can uh, can hear me, and um, we'll uh, we'll set things in motion. Uh, good evening, or good afternoon, or good evening to everybody, depending on what what part of the, the world you're coming from. Um, we'd like to uh, welcome everybody here again to our uh, third um, uh, attempt at our Zoom meetings and. Um, we have to say we are, as a society, we are delighted with uh, the attendance, and we are delighted with uh, the interest and the and the participation that um, that we're getting. So uh, you're all very, very welcome. There will be other people joining as we go along. So um, I will just uh, I will just continue to leave them in. So if there's a little break uh in between here just for uh, a couple of seconds bear in mind that we're just uh, we're just allowing other people come in come into the meeting um so let's just proceed because we have a we have a fairly full itinerary um i think for those of you that have been on before you will understand the format um where we have you know um in tonight's case we have well over a hundred again online um, we started with a target of 25 or 30 when we started our meetings, and um, as I say, they have uh, they have um, really taken off. And um, I suppose as a result of COVID and the and the current situation, people it suits people to be able to log in from their homes, and uh, and I hope I hope you will enjoy it. Um, again, I would just like to to welcome all of our overseas visitors, and like the last time. Um, we seem for a small little parish or a little village or a little society to to be broadcasting far and wide. When we have uh, we have participants online tonight from the U.S., Canada, New Zealand, and uh, three three of our countries across Europe. So it's um, it's a very very good attendance, and we're delighted to see that people. Um, it's a little bit of home, maybe for some people that are that are. Um, that are abroad and to be able to uh, hear a little bit about Kilbritton um, is, uh, is, uh, is always very interesting. So without further ado, I suppose we'll, uh, we'll proceed. Tonight's uh, presentation is put together by uh, Trione O'Sullivan and Con McCarthy. And it is um, speaking about the common demand and the role of the common demand um, in locally. Uh, Triona has a very comprehensive uh, presentation put together detailing on a local level in Kilbritton um, from the records uh, the details of, um, of the, the members that participated. Now we will I'm sure maybe talk a little bit later on but we certainly would be very conscious that in the neighbouring uh, parishes like uh, and the Deeb and the Spittal, Clegoc and, and Newcestown, there was also very active uh, common demand branches. And, you know, <clears throat> we, are, we are just um, this evening talking about the, uh, the Kilbritton um, members and, and, and their, their activities and the, and the role of the common demand. Um, Khan is uh, doing a, a brief presentation on the, the maybe a more of a national perspective on the role of, uh, of uh, women in um in the war of independence and actively in politics as um as as it progressed along um so that that's what this evening is about it's you know uh, i hope you'll find it in, enjoyable and informative uh, i know that there's been a lot of work put into this by both triona and Khan. um and the good thing is that it's there it's there for eternity um so it's it's something that's that's there always. Interesting, just to note, um, we have two um, participants here this evening, uh, whose mothers were active members of Common Demand, and that is Nan McCarthy uh, from Kilbritton, and uh, Molly Drake, uh, or sorry, Maud Drake, um, who uh, whose mother was also an active member of of the Common Demand. Um, okay, so without further ado, we'll uh, we'll go ahead into the presentations. We have um, three presentations in total, 
and then uh, after that we'll uh, save some time for uh, just for um, maybe a few questions and a bit of conversation. If somebody wants to go into the chat box, which is on the bottom of their screen, you can click on that at any stage during the presentation and uh, type in your comments or um, any information um, that uh, you know that you have that might be uh, available to us. Uh, this is uh, this is work in progress, and I think everybody uh, is conscious that there's um, you know we are constantly adding to it. So by all means, we'll welcome your comments positive or negative, uh, because they'll, uh, they'll help us with, with the future. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll start through with the first presentations. The old saying goes, behind every great man is an even greater woman. No truer words were spoken when we talk about the women of Kilbritton, Common Naman, who supported one of the best volunteer companies in the country, the B1 Company Kilbritton, in the 1st Battalion of Cork's 3rd Brigade. Kilbritton, Common Naman was founded in 1917. Although the names of the men of the Kilbritton volunteers are very well known, the same cannot be said for these women of the common Naman. This presentation cannot possibly tell you the full story of each of these ladies and all they did behind the scenes in Ireland's fight for independence, giving as one described their precious years of youth, but it will hopefully scratch the surface. The Irish Volunteers were formed in late 1913 in opposition to the Ulster Volunteers. Women attended this first meeting, but as it did not permit them to join, an executive was formed to establish a separate group for the women. Common Naman was founded during its first public meeting, chaired by Agnes O'Farrelly, on the 2nd of April 1914 at Wynn's Hotel in Dublin. The main aims of the Common Naman was to organise the women in assisting the volunteers to advance the cause of Irish liberty. Many Irish feminists and suffragettes did not want to be seen as submissive to the volunteers and were very critical of the Common Naman in these early stages. Within six months, 63 branches were set up, but with the split in the volunteers over conscription, many of the Conservative members, like O'Farrelly, left leaving a smaller, but stronger and more radical core group. By April 1916, the Military Council of the IRB completed its plan for the Easter Rising, and the Common Amman was included with the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army into the Army of the Irish Republic. Despite the confusion of Easter week, around 200 women participated in the Rising in Dublin, many who were Common Amman members. Leslie Price, who would become the future wife of Tom Barry, was one of the women who chose to ignore the order to return home during Easter week, instead joining the volunteers fighting at the GPO. A teacher by profession, she would later resign her position and played a large part in establishing the Common Naman in West Cork, becoming director of the organisation's All-Ireland Executive after the Rising. The Easter Rising of 1916 was a major changing point for the Common Naman. The women were not cowering at home, invisible, as fighting broke out. And over 70 women were arrested alongside the volunteers after they surrendered. It demonstrated to their doubters that the women could stand alongside the men when it counted. And the common man earned a new respect that had not been shown to them previously. Close to home, Johanna O'Driscoll of Carrie Cannon, inspired by her readings of the Young Ireland newspaper, was so eager to help out with the cause she travelled to Cork City during Easter week to help the volunteers at the parade. In preparation for McCroom, the women of the Balnadee Common Amon, founded in 1915, were busy preparing first aid kits and making haversacks on the sewing machine of Mary O'Donoghue. Mary's sister Nellie O'Donoghue also joined up with Ballandee in these early years, as did Hannah Crowley, Hannah McCarthy, 
and Mary Griffin under Captain Aileen Walsh, later Mrs Richardson. Some of the Kilbritton women living on the eastern side of the parish, such as Julia Manning in Clashavanna, and Hannah Fitzgerald in Clashray, and Margaret Fitzgerald in Molnish Gimlehon, were also eager to get involved, and joined the Balnadee coming on, as there was no branch established yet in Kilbritton. Membership of the Common Amon grew nationally following the Easter Rising, with a considerable number of branches established by 1917, including a branch at Kilbritton. This coincided with the formation of the Kilbritton Volunteers, who formed in April that year, and the earliest Common Amon members were typically the sisters of these men. In one of the few female witness statements recorded from West Cork, Mary O'Neill, better known as Molly of Maryborough, Kilbritton, recalled how in the absence of her brothers who were at McCroom that Easter, she and her sister Maud were called upon to help out. This sparked their interest in the volunteer movement and the RIC raids on their homes, which were to follow, further increased that desire to help out in any way they could. Miss Walsh of Kilbrogan Hill Bandon, also heavily influenced by her brothers who took part in the Rising in Dublin, was instrumental in getting branches of the Common Amon going in the area, and she approached Molly O'Neill to begin a branch in Kilbritton. Ten members were required to start a branch, and instructions from headquarters in Dublin were passed on through Miss Walsh. Molly O'Neill was elected captain, Sis Crowley of Ivy Lodge became secretary, and Hannah O'Brien Clambuig appointed treasurer. After its foundation, Kilbritton Common Amon quickly became one of the strongest branches in the area, having 26 members within five years. This map shows the homes of those Kilbritton members whose names are in the records, which were spread over every corner of the parish. In the west of the parish was branch captain Molly O'Neill and her sister Maud, living in Maryborough. Margaret O'Driscoll, Neo Riley, and her sister Mary Ann Colnan were living in Burren, with Lena Hurley O'Neill in Arda Crow and Mary McGrath in Lachine Lean or Flaxford. Mary O'Mani was flying the flag for Clounderine, and moving north towards Bandon was Margaret Fitzgerald of Molnish Gimlehon. Nearing Kilbritton were the Crowley sisters of Ivy Lodge, Birdie, and Sis, who was secretary, and Kathleen O'Sullivan in Glenduff. The townland of Clambuig was well represented by treasurer Hannah O'Brien and her sister Frances, their neighbour Lena Barrett and Hannah Barrett in Balance Scubbig. Near my own townland here in the south of the parish was Catherine O'Reilly, Grenassig, Mary O'Leary Housestrand, who lived at the forge, and Johanna O'Driscoll in Carry Cannon, who had joined the Cork coming on earlier on. Fitzgerald's sisters Julia or Lou and her sister Hannah were living in Clash Ray. Julia Manning was up in Clash of Anna and was involved with many of the Balnadee girls like Hannah Crowley, the O'Donoghue sisters Mary and Nellie, Hannah McCarthy and Mary Griffin, who fell in with the Kilbritton Common Amon during the War of Independence. Common Amon also had two members living in Cork City on College Road, Catherine and her sister Mary. The majority of the women who joined Kilbritton Common Amon were relatively young, Mary McGrath was only 15 or 16 years old when she joined, and most of the women were single, without children, and devoted all their time to the common man. After the formation of the Kilbritton Common Man, meetings were held following a weekly Irish class. Early activities during 1917 and 1918 carried out included drilling and first aid classes for members. The women kept busy making haversacks and bandoliers, knitting socks and underclothing and preparing first aid kits for the volunteers. Fundraising was a vital and often overlooked role that the common among women took on, carrying out anti-conscription house-to-house -house collections and chapel gate collections. Fair days, flag days, dances and concerts were held and money collected was given to the Republican Dependence Fund and to the IRA to purchase arms. It was also during these earlier years that the Kilbritton Common Amon began the organisation of safe houses 
and assisted the general election of 1918 by bringing people out to vote. First aid and medical treatment was one of the most important roles carried out by the common Naman, especially in an area like Kilbritton, where injuries, violence, shootings and death were unfortunately not a rare occurrence during the height of the War of Independence. Early after its formation in 1917, the Kilbritton branch prioritised first aid skills, holding regular classes for members under the direction and supervision of Nurse Lorden from Newcestown, Dr Colnan of Clonakilty and Dr Crowley of Kilbritton. First aid outfits or kits were provided to company volunteers as well as to battalion officers. First aid outfits included items such as bandages and antiseptic wool, iodine tincture as an antiseptic and carbolic lotion, a disinfectant with the distinct red colour we all remember from carbolic soap such as Red Boy, antiseptic dressings such as boracic lint, white lint and iodoform gauze which were used to pack wounds and clean sheets and clean towels had to be made available, which we must remember was in a time pre-electric washing machines. Quick-thinking Hannah Barrett of Ballin Scubbig would later use her medical knowledge in an unusual and clever manner to save volunteer John Dorgan Barrett from being arrested by the military surrounding her home. She painted his neck with iodine and quickly pushed him into a bed on the pretense that he was a dying man. Dorothy Stopford, a female Trinity graduate, was appointed to her first job as a medical doctor in the Kilbritton Dispensary in 1921. She's better known for her brilliant work in the fight against TB with the introduction of the BCG vaccine to Ireland, but in Kilbritton would be fondly remembered as the rebel doctor. Although of an Anglo-Irish Protestant background, Dorothy had witnessed the events of Easter week 1916 while living in Dublin and was also greatly influenced by her aunt, Alice Stopford Green. She accepted the position during the height of the action in Kilbritton and as her sympathy lay with the Republicans, there was no shortage of work for her new sideline as medical officer for the IRA. Dorothy initially took lodgings in Weltons of Flaxford, but later found her own place in Harbour View, where she enjoyed the beautiful Kilbritton coastline. The new doctor caused quite a stir when she arrived in Kilbritton as the lady doctor with an English accent who did her rounds riding horseback after being denied a permit for a bicycle. Every member of the Kilbritton Common Amon credits Dr Stopford with teaching them their first aid skills during classes held at Harbour View. Sis Crowley, described by Dorothy as one of her most valued nurses, learnt a great deal of medical skills by accompanying her on home visits around the parish. Dorothy taught essential and useful first aid techniques, such as stemming a blood loss. Indeed, before the IRA accepted a lady doctor, they challenged her own skills to stop the blood flow of a man with gigantic biceps, as they did not think she could do it. She was watched in silence as she applied a tourniquet to the archery and twisted and twisted with a pencil to tighten it. As the pulse stopped, she was accepted as a worthy doctor to the West Cork IRA. Kilbritton was certainly leading the way in the West Cork Common Amon branches for first aid training. Women from the Bannispital branch attended first aid classes given by Dr Stopford and two of the Kilbritton girls, Birdie Crowley and Julia Fitzgerald. Birdie had learned so much from Dorothy that she was able to provide lectures on practical first aid with Maud O'Neill to the women in the neighbouring branches of Common Amon in Clagoch, Timelig and Gagan, who were then examined by a doctor. Mary O'Leary and Mary O'Manny also gave first aid classes to the Clonakilty branch in April 1921. Exactly 100 years ago, Dorothy held a large first aid event for the whole battalion, 
which ran for a full week at the home of Lena Hurley O'Neill at Ardcrow House, Kilbritton. The aim was to train a member from each branch in the battalion and 16 girls attended and were billeted in Ardcrow and nearby. Attendees were supplied with a small first aid kit containing a scissors, lint, gauze, bandages and pins. Lectures and training were provided by Dorothy and Brigade Nurse Lorden. Lena's daughter, Nan McCarthy, who painted this wonderful image of Ardicrow House, was told how the two large rooms on either side of the main hallway were opened up and joined together to cater for the large crowd attending. The event was a serious affair with certificates awarded by Dr Con Lucy, Brigade MD, to those who successfully passed an examination at the end of the course. The Kilbritton women in Common Amon would have been very used to what was then considered women's work for their families in the early 20th century. However, the amount of laundry and cooking involved as members of Common Amon was at another level altogether. One has to admire the ability and organisational skills of these women to cater for such a large volume of men over a sustained period of years, often with very little notice, if any at all. Laundry was an extremely important practical function carried out by the ladies and in a time prior to electricity was not a job to be underestimated. Clean underwear, shirts, socks and bed linen were at the ready in all houses if a volunteer came to hide out or recuperate. Nearly every pension file of the women mentions the number of meals they prepared for volunteers and it varied considerably depending on the activity in the area. It is difficult to imagine today, 100 years later, being organised enough to prepare this volume of meals with little notice. We also have to remember the women did all this work without electric ovens, washing machines or having fridges and freezers to prepare meals in advance. Nearly every member of the Kilbritton Common Amon spent a huge amount of time and often their own money catering for men attending meetings in their homes or feeding and billeting volunteers on the run. It was nothing new for Lena Hurley O'Neill to run over to Timaleague to buy five loaves of bread for volunteers arriving with no notice. Common Amman women, particularly in the east of the parish, such as Hannah Barrett, Lena Barrett, Hannah O'Brien and her sister Frances did Trojan work for the hungry volunteers, particularly at the training camps in Clonbuig, sometimes providing between 100 and 200 meals every week. By 1919, as the volunteer activity in the War of Independence was hotting up in West Cork, Leslie Price travelled from Dublin to approach Molly Walsh to organise dividing up Cork's 1st Battalion area, as it was too large. Miss Price called a meeting at Callanan's in Ballycatton, and the South Bandon District Council was formed. The District Council included six areas, Kilbritton, Bannaspital, Clogoch, Timaleague, Gagan and Barry Row. Kilbritton demonstrated their strength at the centre of this district council when two Kilbritton officers, Molly Walsh and Sis Crowley, were unanimously elected as president and secretary of this newly formed group. The military archives contain records from 1921 and 1922, which give us a good indication of numbers in the Common Amman branch in this period. The records also contain some membership lists of these branches, but unfortunately does not include a list from Kilbritton. It does state, however, that in 1921 and 1922, Kilbritton branch had 26 members, with 107 members overall in the South Bandon district. It must also be noted that around this time that the girls in Balnadi Common Amon, who although were one of the first groups to be formed, did not have the required members to keep going, and these women transferred to the Kilbritton or the newly formed oh, yeah. branch. The Kilbritton Common Amon organised a network of safe houses all around the parish for volunteers on the run or men home from prison. The location of these houses was vital due to the nature of the guerrilla warfare and the women were always on the lookout, 
keeping watch whilst the hungry volunteers ate their meals. The homes of women such as Margaret O'Driscoll, Mary Ann Cullinan, both in Burren, Mary McGrath in Lishina Lean and Lena Hurley O'Neill of Arda Crow were important strategic lookouts as they had excellent views of Cote McSherry across the bay where British military were stationed or they could keep an eye on any movement along the coast road. Julia Manning had an eagle eye of the parish from her home up in Clashavanna and scouted for many of the officers of the IRA. Mary O'Leary and Catherine O'Reilly, living in Granasig, kept a close eye on the British stationed at House Strand. Mary O'Leary helped volunteers escape out their skylight at the forge and travel by water from House Strand around the coast to Harbourview, hiding around Coolmain. A brave task to carry out under the noses of the British Coast Guards. She was also the only girl in the area with access to an arms dump. Those living in houses without a view of the action were equally important. Houses located on quiet roads adjacent to the main thoroughfare to Bandon or Kinsale were of great use to the men of the Flying Column or any volunteers looking for a safe house to rest in. The home of Margaret Fitzgerald of Mollish Gimlehon was described as midway between Kilbritton and Bandon in a quiet district and often used for billeting, nursing wounded and for dispatches. The farm of Kathleen O'Sullivan Glenduff was another prime location. Situated just outside the village, it was ideal as a central dispatch centre and used by officers when preparing for any ambushes in Kilbritton village. Kathleen, it was said, took a man's part as a scout and, like many of the women, took charge of the arms dump on her farm. Kathleen also had to take on the farm work with her sister when her brother was imprisoned. Lena Hurley O'Neill's house in Arda Crow was considered a very safe spot for a time as she had no brothers and the RIC foolishly underestimated that families of girls posed no threat. Women who got married during these years continued to help the volunteers even when they had left Kilbritton Parish. Johanna O'Driscoll, who married her husband Thomas Janine in the Dower House in 1917, when the church was being renovated, moved from Carrickannon to Knocknagalock. Despite having young children, she continued to provide a safe haven in her new home, which was ideally situated a long way off the main road. The IRA utilised many of the women of Kilbritton coming among to dispatch messages, sometimes written and often verbally. The women often accompanied the volunteers around West Cork acting as what was called a blind or a cloak to carry and conceal weapons and documents. As a volunteer travelling with a woman aroused far less suspicion. The common amon were an effective and efficient means of transferring messages up and down the country. And although the women were less likely to be searched by the all-male RIC, the risks they took acting as blinds were enormous. The RIC greatly underestimated the power of the Common Amon and for many years the organisation was barely mentioned in inspector reports. Leslie Price succeeded in conveying messages from Common headquarters up and down from Dublin without ever being found out. In 1921, the year she married Tom Barry, Leslie stayed in Kilbritton arranging meetings in Clownderreen, travelling to Dunmanway and Neusestown on a pony and trap driven by the Kilbritton Common Amon, all the while evading the military. Towards the end of the War of Independence, Major Percival of the Essex Regiment even conceded that the Common Amon intelligence system reached a very high standard of efficiency. In July 1920, Birdie Crowley accompanied her brother Paddy and Fleur Begley on a cycle of 65 miles to Fairmount to collect revolvers and ammunition from a friend back from London. Birdie concealed the arms, but unfortunately, after travelling only a few hundred yards towards home, were stopped by a party of soldiers. The men were thoroughly searched, but fortunately for Birdie, she held her nerve, stuck to their made-up story and was not searched by the soldiers.
Mary O'Mahony of Clownderine became a dispatch bearer for the IRA, sometimes cycling up to 60 miles a day for some of the most senior men in Cork's 3rd Brigade, who provided her with a bicycle. On one occasion, acting as a blind, she helped smuggle an injured Michael Crowley back from the priest's house in Ahiol by disguising him as a lady. Mary would also travel as far as Cork City to carry a dispatch for Dick Barrett to the Wallace sisters, who ran an intelligence network for the IRA from their unsuspecting little shop in St Augustine Street in the heart of the city. Frances O'Brien of Clomboig acted as a cloak for Liam DC and Tom Barry all over West Cork. She once drove a pony and trap to the old head for arms collected detonators and fuses for the volunteers in McSweeney's hardware shop in Bandon, and daringly had the nerve to collect two boxes of revolvers disguised as a hardware delivery off the train in Bandon and return them successfully with her brother. By 1920 these roles became a much more dangerous one for the women of the common Amman. Late that year the British authorities began employing female searchers who sometimes accompanied raiding parties to the homes of Republican suspects. These female searches were introduced to Cork in 1920. Such was the effectiveness of the women. Major Percival of the Essex Regiment even acknowledged in his papers that the common Amman intelligence system had reached a very high standard of efficiency. Francis O'Brien, Clambuig, refers to the presence of women searchers in Bandon, during December 1920, when she said, At this time, things were extremely hot in Bandon Town and in the battalion area generally. No man could venture alone on a job as he would be likely to be held up by the enemy in the town, which was an every minute occurrence there. I claim that I played my part, a dangerous one also, as there were enemy women searchers stationed in the town. Birdie Crowley, a sister of Sis and a qualified teacher working in Kilbritton National School, was secretly using her position to carry out intelligence work for the IRA. She was appointed Special Intelligence Officer by Charlie Hurley in 1918, and although she twice asked the IRA for permission to resign from the school, they ordered her to remain as it was the perfect decoy for her intelligence work. The school was used to collect and dispatch documents, sometimes being exchanged through the children's school bags. The principal was very supportive and allowed Birdie to come and go if she needed to. However, her teaching career did suffer, as all her energies were channeled into her work for the common Amman, leaving her no time to progress her teaching grade in the training college. Birdie also called to the family shop on her way to and from the school without arousing suspicion and was able to spy on the barracks from the gable window without being seen. From there, she was able to record how many men were in the barracks, the times they left, how often they left and when the officers changed over. The Hayes sisters from Rathpeakin, northwest of Cork City, named Catherine and Mary, unusually joined the Kilbritton branch of Common Amman, probably on the orders of the Cork Brigade. Catherine, the younger sister, lived in Kilbritton for a time, but in 1920 was instructed by the IRA to remain with the Kilbritton branch but to return to her sister's house in the city, a stone's throw from UCC. This house on College Road was an important safe retreat and call house for dispatches in the city for the volunteers of Cork's 3rd and 1st Brigades, along with some men from the Kerry Brigade. Number 4 Laurelhurst College Road was described as general headquarters and a hospital for the wounded, with the Hayes sisters helping many a man from West Cork who needed a place to stay in the city. Volunteers released from prison are those injured badly enough that they required treatment in a Cork City hospital, describes some of those accommodated by the Hayes girls at College Road. 
Catherine in particular fully dedicated her time completely to her work for the common Amman. And in her pension claim is described over and over by the likes of Tom Barry, Leslie Price and Sis Crowley as one of the most trusted and reliable members within the ranks of common Amman. She described her brave intelligence work at College Road by befriending and providing critical information on a neighbour, Beale, of the anti Sinn Féin murder gang and demonstrated her nerves of steel in her ability to run a central safe house under his nose without arousing suspicion. Catherine was also instrumental in assisting the risky escape of Michael McPeak from College Road and out of the country and did not think twice about caring for escaped prisoners during the truce period. Many of the homes in Kilbritton, once considered safe, would soon come under the radar of the British forces. The arrival of the Black and Tans in Kilbritton sent a wave of fear into the homes of all those in the common Amman, especially those with brothers who were active in the volunteers. This was a violent and terrifying period for the women who now had to cope with raids happening on a daily basis, sometimes more than once in a day when the raiders arrived back in the dead of night. These plucky women had to face the bullying tactics of the black and tans on their own and often without the protection of the volunteer men in the family who were either on the run or already imprisoned. Some very clever tactics were used to deal with these raids. Margaret O'Driscoll of Byrne, who kept Charlie Hurley for five months after he was released from prison in very poor shape, hung this large framed British Navy flag collection shown here, which was belonged to her brother-in-law, Dinnis, as he had served with the Royal Navy, right inside the door. This was the first thing seen on entering and immediately had the desired calming effect on the raiding party. Little did the military know that the British flags were also being used to cover arms and ammunition right behind it. Mary O'Mahony in Clounderine would hang a white sheet on her line as a signal to the IRA if it was not safe to call. Her home would be burnt down by the Tans in a raid in 1921, with only Mary, her mother and a maid in the house. The women were only allowed leave with one change of clothes. Today, Francie O'Brien regales the story of Dr Dorothy Stopford, who saved the O'Brien household in Clownbuig when Major Percival tried to burn it down, with the elderly Mr O'Brien confined to his bed. The plucky doctor threatened the Major with telling every British newspaper of this cowardly act forcing him to withdraw his Essex regimen. There are countless stories in the pension files of the women saving the volunteers from arrest and the women were on the alert 24-7 for trouble. On a raid of Clambuig when the soldiers were in a particularly vicious mood and determined to kill any volunteer, Hannah O'Brien snuck out to warn five volunteers staying in a house nearby. Mary McGrath, who used to watch the movements of the military from Coat Mac, once saved up to 20 volunteers from arrest when she spotted them coming from Timaleague. Any traces of the volunteers, such as cigarette butts or footprints, had to be destroyed at speed. Molly O'Neill, who pretended a volunteer's pack of cigarettes were her own when they were found, and she was forced to smoke her first ever cigarette under the gaze of Percival. He was highly disappointed when she did so without even flinching. Ivy Lodge, home of the Crowley sisters, was a particular target for the Black and Tens, being raided 10 or 12 times a week, as all four brothers were known to be very active with the volunteers. In January 1920, a group of drunken auxiliaries with no warning started firing random shots into the house late at night, necessitating the family to hide outside until it was over. The following year, in 1921, 
Ivy Lodge was burnt out completely as the elderly Mr Crowley would not give up information on his sons. The family suffered a terrifying ordeal, given only three minutes to leave, while the tans smashed windows and poured petrol in the windows. The house was partially ablaze before the family escaped, and on the advice of one decent soldier, retreated to the woods behind their house to avoid being shot. The following day, a lorry of drunken soldiers returned, continuing to fire shots over the burnt remains of the house, looting what they could, even taking fowl and vegetables from the garden. Whose house was burnt? Our house, Crowley. Where? Below Ivy Lodge. At Ivy Lodge, yeah. And this shop was burnt here, too, or not? What year was that? How long ago? That's 1922, uh, is Yes. I, I don't know. I've not been to be born, but in 1920. It was 1920. Yes, well. and you used to go up to the O'Neill's in Maribor, is yeah, it? Yeah, I used yeah. to go up to the I'd go from school, I had a boy, I was teaching here, and I'd go up to Maribor in the evening when we had no house or for the bond, you see. And I'd stay at Neil's for a week, and I'd go down to Fitzgerald's and other cousins, friends, not cousins. And for another two weeks. So I know everyone, the men, poor Molly and Ma, they have a lovely dinner for me when I go. Very nice. After, very my, nice. after my school. Yeah. They were very good. Right. Oh, I know them all. So they and were all fairly young at the time. And in May 1921, during a raid at their home in Maryborough, the O'Neill girls were so badly beaten by the military that Maud O'Neill responded to the UK, pre UK press when she was so infuriated by a letter printed that described the army's good behaviour. Her account of the beatings were published in the Catholic Herald and affected her mother so badly she never walked alone again. Describing the horrific beatings of her mother, Maud O'Neill said, They struck her hands with the butts of their rifles and she fell prostrate. The soldiers tried to drag me out and being unable to do so, one of them caught me by the throat, put his knee to my back and knocked me down. He said he would choke the life out of me. Shootings and funerals of the volunteers, killed in action, were unfortunately not a rare event in Kilbritton. Molly O'Neill, as captain of the Kilbritton Common Amon, had been instructed what to do in such a case that a volunteer was shot. The women of Kilbert and Common Naman played a key role and would spring into action during these tragic times, running miles at haste for the priest, passing on dispatches about the shooting, organising coffins and waking the bodies before their burials. 1921 was a particularly bleak period for funerals in Kilbritton. Mary O'Manny was ordered to identify the body of volunteer Daniel O'Reilly at the workhouse in Bandon. A brother of Common Amon member Catherine, he was killed by the British soldiers in an attack on Bandon military barracks. During early February of the same year, the O'Neill sisters bravely tried to prevent Major Percival from killing Paddy Crowley during a raid on their home in Maryborough. Paddy was ill at the time awaiting an appendectomy and Maud courageously held on to Percival's legs as he tried to climb a gate in pursuit of Paddy. Her attempts were unfortunately in vain and Paddy Crowley was shot. The O'Neill girls carried his body back to their house. Lena Hurley O'Neill and Kate O'Sullivan had to run the three miles to Kilbritton to fetch a priest. It was indeed a bleak day for the Crowleys whose house had just been burnt by the Black and Tans. Sonny Crowley had been arrested and was badly treated by the Essex Regiment and got word of his brother's death while in custody. Paddy was waked at Maryborough and buried in Clogoch Cemetery. Less than two weeks later, four volunteers were shot at Krishnalanov. Jack McGrath, a brother of Common Naman member Mary, Cornelius McCarthy, Timothy Connolly and Jeremiah O'Neill 
were all killed during a surprise attack by an Essex regiment while they were trenching a road. The local common man members, including Lena Barrett, identified the bodies and the O'Brien sisters and Miss Fitzgerald disarmed them and collected their personal belongings. Hannah Barrett washed and prepared the bodies for burial after they were shouldered to the Crowley farmhouse in Killinentig by Hannah Finn, Hannah Crowley, Nell Griffin and Hannah O'Brien. Captain Molly O'Neill organised coffins from O'Reilly's funeral home in Bandon and the bodies were waked in Crowley's. It was mainly the women who attended the early morning burial at Clashavanna as the area was surrounded by military and it was unsafe for volunteers to attend. In March 1921, under orders of the IRA captain, Molly O'Neill arranged for the Kilbritton Common Man women to smuggle the body of Brigadier Charlie Hurley out of the workhouse in Bandon with the help of nurse Babe Crowley. Charlie had been engaged to Leslie Price when he was killed at Ford's Bally Murphy on the morning of the Crossberry ambush. The women kept an all-night vigil by his body at St Maluda's Church and marched in the funeral when burial took place in the middle of the night at Clagoch. By the time of the truce in July 1921, the mental stamina of the women of the Common Amman was beginning to break. They had spent years utilising their first aid skills and tending to the physical injuries of the volunteers who were shot, burnt or suffering exhaustion due to being constantly on the run. Without perhaps realising it, they would also have tended to the mental health of these volunteers also. At times, the pension files reveals glimpses of the nervous exhaustion of the men and women in this period, which is understandable after sustaining years of living on the edge. Witnessing traumatic killings tending to bodies of deceased loved ones and the prolonged stress of expecting raids would have tried even the most resilient of characters. One woman described how the stress of the role caused her to go into premature labour while pregnant. Margaret Fitzgerald of Maulish Gimlehan and later Calatrim Bandon gave a rare insight into the mental health of the women of Kilbert and Cumann following the War of Independence. At the truce, I was almost broken down by the shock caused by the war, daily expecting attacks and the loss of life of the volunteers, all of whom I knew personally, in Balnady and Kilbritton, both officers. The Civil War was one of the most bitter and difficult periods in Irish history. Cumann held a special convention in Dublin in which they voted overwhelmingly to reject the treaty. There is, however, also an opinion that the women who supported the treaty did not send delegates to attend or vote at this convention. Although the general opinion held is that all the women in Cumann were anti-treaty, this was not actually the case. Pro-treaty Cumann women such as Jenny Weisspower Alice Stopford Green and Louise Gavin Duffy established a new branch known as Common Nasirsha, leaving those remaining in Common Naman as anti treaty. Although this new group had a strong following in Cork City, it does not appear to have had much support from the women of Kilbritton. According to branch secretary Sis Crowley, who was appointed to the Red Cross ambulance during the Civil War, Membership in Kilbritton did not fall away during this period and those remaining would have adopted an anti-treaty stance. On searching the military archives, it is heartbreaking to read how the Kilbritton women who previously risked their lives for volunteers were now speaking of the same men as enemy free staters. The common Naman women supplied volunteers moving to Donegal and Limerick with cigarettes and socks and sent packages to men imprisoned at Tintown Camp and the Curragh. 
It is also striking how little the women actually write about the Civil War period in the pension claims when compared to the detailed pages they record about the years prior to 1922. One certainly gets the sense that the deep wounds caused by the Civil War were still too raw and too painful to talk about a mere decade later. The pension files of the military archives are a valuable resource available to everybody online. The acts relevant to the common among women were the Army Pensions Acts and the Military Service Pension Acts. The first Military Service Pension Act of 1924 effectively excluded the Kilburton women by not including common among in the list of organisations covered by the Act. This was remedied in 1934 and it was this Act that would provide it for the payment of military service for the majority of the women in Kilburton common among who rendered active service during these 10 periods between Easter week 1916 and the end of the Civil War in 1923. In determining active service, Grade D, the second lowest grade, was the best grade a common man member could hope to achieve. Only Molly O'Neill and Sis Crowley, as officers of the South Bandon District, were deemed eligible to be awarded Grade D. The majority of the Kilbritton common man women were only eligible to apply for the lowest grade, Grade E, which did not fully recognise the dangerous risks they had taken and the sacrifices they had made. From reading the Kilbritton files, it is apparent that many of the members were not conditioned to describe fully their act of service, and the majority had to fight very hard to appeal their cases, seeking supporting letters from IRA men like Tom Barry, Liam Deasy and Tyg Sullivan to name but a few. Some of the Kilbritton women had emigrated to the USA or were not well enough to travel to Dublin and it was difficult to make their case to the appeal board. A letter written by Florence Begley speaks of the consternation caused when Mary O'Leary, one of the best of the very active girls in Kilbritton, got her 21-day notice. Leslie Price highlighted the danger and risks these Kilbritton women took when she wrote... In areas like theirs of West Cork, where a big active service column operated, the members of Common Amon often had to travel with groups of armed men to act as covers or blinds to the British military. At periods like those, the women ran the same risk of death in a likely fight. These applicants did this almost every day of the week and may find it difficult in the limited space given to give day and dates for these events. Due consideration should be given for this verification of the fact that they did give active service and active service in the really military sense of the word. The Department of Defence presented a Kogan Assyrsha, or War of Independence Medal, to all the men and women who received their military service pensions in respect of active service between 1917 and 1921. Medals with service bar bear the word Korak, meaning combat, and the central figure is of a volunteer of that period. The black and tan ribbon symbolises those they fought against in their struggle for independence for Ireland 100 years ago. The families of Kilbritton women Lena Hurley O'Neill, Mary McGrath and Hannah Barrett are proud to say they still have medals or the medal card accompanying it, to remember the contribution their relatives made to the Common Naman. Today, the women of Kilbritton Common Naman deserve to be recognised and remembered for their hard work, sacrifices, and the risks they took in Ireland's fight for independence. In his book Guerrilla Days in Ireland, Tom Barry rightly acknowledged this splendid group of young women, who he said were indispensable to the IRA, nursing the wounded and sick carrying dispatches, scouting, acting as intelligence agents, arranging billets, raising funds, knitting, washing, cooking for the act of service men and burying our dead. With the release of the archives, the story of Kilbritton Common Naman is still being pieced together. But with the passings of generations, much of the information is lost forever. I hope as a result of remembering these courageous women, that more information and even more names will come. Thank you.
When you honor in song and in story The fighters who shouldered the gun And wreck not that death's blow shall reach them If so, Ireland's freedom be won Then here's to the women of Ireland Who march without fear in the van Old Ireland is proud of its daughters Hurrah for brave common man Our tricolour flew on the breeze Dublin's old town But the men of the nation Awaken Would die T'was ever So here's to the women of Ireland Who march without fear in the van Old Ireland is proud of its daughters Hurrah for brave common man Though our fight in the old GPO Thank you very much, Triona, and um, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, we should, uh, if we were in a normal circumstance, maybe be, give you a round of applause or, or, or possibly a standing ovation for, um, for that excellent presentation. And, uh, you know, the, the detail, the photographs, the records, and I can only imagine the amount of time that was put into putting all of that together for all of us to have uh, going forward. I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a brilliant piece for us all to keep and to have going forward. I'm sure we'll come back to chat a little bit later on about it. We have another um, piece to finish um, on more on a national perspective, which uh, is being presented by Con McCarthy. So uh, we just uh, move on to that one, please. I'll just 
say a few words about coming them on on a national basis. But first, I might talk about another organisation, another nationalist female organisation that was set up in 1900, and that was Inina Hearn, our Daughters of Ireland, and that was set up by Maud Gunn. Now, the aim of Inina Hearn was the, the, the complete independence of Ireland, the promotion of Irish customs, games, music, language, and the support of Irish manufacturing goods. No branches of of in here were mainly in Dublin, but there were some active branches around the country. We know there was a very active branch in Limerick and here in Cork. There was a branch formed in Cork. I think it was formed in the homes of the McSweeney sisters. Now, in in here, also brought out a paper called Ben Hearden, and so that was published for some time. In nineteen hundred and nine, uh, Nafina Hearden. This was a Republican by by scout, a Republican scouting organization, and this was set up by Countess Markovich, and she set it up with the help of others like uh, Bulmer Hobson and others. Uh, in January the nineteen thirteen, the Ulster Volunteer Force, uh, uh, the UVF for short, was formed, and this was formed to oppose Home Rule. In November nineteen thirteen, the Irish National Volunteers were formed. Uh, and the first meeting was held there to set him up in Wynn's Hotel in Dublin, and that was as a direct result of the Ulster Volunteer Force in Belf- in, in the North. Now, uh, in early April in 1914, uh, a meeting was held in Wynn's Hotel again in Dublin, and Cumnor Man was set up there, and Countess Markovich was appointed its first president. Now, in in here and then became a a, a, a branch of Common Man, and we will see in the nineteen sixteen in in here was a very very a very active in the nineteen sixteen rising and was a very active branch. Uh, during. 1915 and 1916, the British government, through its Department of Education, gave a grant here in Ireland uh, for people who passed a, a course in first aid. These courses were held around the country, and many members of the Common uh, uh, became involved in these courses and were s- successful in them, and were uh, received a small grant uh, for completing the course. Uh, in Limerick, there was something like forty-eight to fifty pounds of a grant was paid, and this was sent it went directly into the Arms Fund for the volunteer with for the volunteers, which is quite ironic. Now, the Constitution of Cumbernaughton, the Constitution of Cumbernaughton is quite interesting, and like the first uh, 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 objective was the complete separation of Ireland from all from all foreign powers. Then it was the, and then the next one was the unity of Ireland, and then the Gaelicization of Ireland, and then it, 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 their means of doing it was to maintain the republic by every means in our power against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I'll repeat that against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So we'll see their stand, their stance later on in the civil war. Uh, to assist Ulrich Neher and the Irish volunteers in its fight to maintain uh, the Republic. So that's just uh, some of, of, of the constitution of Cumberland Now, moving on to 1916, uh, the rising commenced in Dublin on Easter Monday, uh, on Easter Monday at 12 midday. Now, it was to have commenced the previous day, as we know, but due to the countermanding orders uh, issued by Owen McNeil, it it began on the, the Monday. At first, women were turned away from from a number of posts across the city, but the leadership uh, in the GPO issued orders that women were to be accepted into any of the posts in, in which they would uh, end. All of the posts except the women, except two. So while a, 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 only a relatively small number of women actually fought. You no, know, a number of women a, a, were in the citizen army, so a small number of them actually fought and actually took up arms. But the vast majority of the members of Common Man, their role was a far more practical role. Their role was that they staffed the field hospital at the GPO, at, or at the rear of the GPO. Uh, they carried dispatches across the city. They communicated from one post to another, and they cooked food, and they they they, they tended to the wounded. 
So it's hard to put an exact figure on, on the number of women who took part in the rising, but we believe that there was in the region of about at least 200. We know that in the region of about 80, 70 to 80 who were, uh, were arrested and imprisoned. Um, now, in, in one, just looking at one post there, uh, Sean Condy uh, uh, attempted to get into Dublin Castle and when he failed to get into Dublin Castle, he took city, the City Hall. Uh, you know, at the time he had a, on a group of about 20 with him and they were made up of about 10 or 11 men and maybe nine women. Uh, no, uh, Sean Connolly was shot very uh, early on and Dr Kathleen Lynn actually took charge of the City Hall. Um, Now, some of the well-known names who, who were involved in 1916, of the well-known females that were involved in 1916, and this is only just a, a, just a, a short, ju just a few of them now. And Countess Markovitch, as we know, well, uh, uh, and we know that her, her role was, uh, and uh, uh, we, we so and in the, in the next person I come to is Madeleine French Mullen. Elizabeth O'Farrell then, she uh, was a nurse or a midwife and she was the GPO and she actually uh, delivered the surrender documents for Patrick Pierce. Louise Gavin Duffy, Nora Conley, Nora Conley again was the daughter of James Conley's and in one of her own oral statements she states that she actually cooked breakfast for some of the men in Conley Hall on the morning, uh, on, on Easter Monday morning. Winnie Carey was another uh, that was involved Nora Daly, Helena Maloney, Nelly Gifford, and Dr. Kathleen Lynn. And that's only just a, 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 a small number of those that were involved. Uh, there were about maybe close enough to 80 were in prisons, where well, I mean, 70 and 80 were imprisoned. Now, the most of them were released on the 8th of May. But a number that we believe maybe up to about 12 uh, were, uh, were kept in prison. But just some of the names, uh, not all of the names, but some of the names of those th that were kept in prison were Helena Maloney, Nelly uh, Gifford, uh, Madeleine uh, French Mullen, Dr. Kathleen Lynn. We also know that Mary McSweeney was arrested in Cork and um, Nell Ryan was arrested probably in Wexford, or she may have been arrested in Dublin. She was a Wexford native. Now, Countess Markovitch was sentenced to death, but this was commuted by Maxwell to penal servitude for life. And it's felt that, that he did this because she was a woman and it would have been unacceptable uh, to have her executed. Now, she was released eventually in uh, later on in 1917. Um, now, Cumberland actually collected funds and uh, and collected money and sent food to, to, to prisoners who were in prison uh, as a result of 1916 and they sent uh, a number of food parcels and, and other goods. Now, after 1916, then the Cumberland, uh, I definitely feel that they had a, a fairly major effect in, 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 in the role into the War of Independence. But one of the first things that happened after 1916 was the city up of the National Aid and the Volunteers Dependence Fund, and that was set up to help families uh, as a result uh, who had suffered greatly as a result of 1916. Uh, Kathleen Clark uh, had a fund uh, which helped initially uh, to set up uh, uh, the Dependence Fund, and the fund or the sum of money that she had had been given to her from it came through the IRB and came to her through her husband Tom Clark before 1916. Um, Coming on, helped to fundraise uh, and and to distribute the fund. Uh, when Michael Collins uh, was released from Van Gogh in a bit before Christmas, or in days coming up to Christmas in 1916. Uh, having returned to West Cork in early 1917, he went back to he went to Dublin, and he was appointed to secretary by Kathleen Clark of the Volunteers Dependents Fund, and this put Michael Collins in a very key role because he was dealing with a lot of the families uh, who had suffered results in 1916, but he also had received a number of the names of the people who were in the IRB from Kathleen Clark. And I've no doubt that this was a major help to Michael Collins uh, going forward. 
During 1917, uh, the Combin of Man was reorganised and it spread right across the country. And by 1918, it had more than 600 branches uh, in, in the country. Now, in the general election of 1918, then women over the age of 30 were given a vote for the first time. This was probably a result of the suffragette movement and the, uh, uh, the efforts that were made to gain votes for females. Now, in the same election, men over the age of 21 had a vote. So here we see the discrepancy between the age of women at 30 and men at, uh, at 21 gaining a vote. Countess Markovich was elected. Uh, she was the first female probably elected in, in what was in the United Kingdom. But she obviously didn't take her seat in in the in, in the British Parliament, and she sat in in the first hall. And the first hall sat uh, in the twenty first uh, of January. It met on the twenty first of January nineteen nineteen, and um, a, a a government was set up shortly afterwards. And Countess Markovitch was uh, made Minister for Labour, and she was the first female uh, minister uh, in Europe, to my knowledge. Same day, day, day then, uh, uh, that the first all met, um, Solohead Beg, uh, 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 two other seamen were shot in Solohead Beg. Uh, they were escorting a load of explosives to a quarry and they were, they, they were uh, shot by uh, Tipperary IRA under Dan Breen and Sean Tracy and others. Um, this is regarded by, by many historians as the start of the War of Independence. But we do know that there were other events that happened. We know that maybe I think Baden Glen happened out near Bellavorna before it. But but historians regard this as as the start of the War of Independence. Then during the War of Independence then women provided food and clothing and safe uh, and, and safe houses for the men on their own. They acted as scouts, they often hid weapons and documents uh, on their body and they cared for injured men and many of them did intelligence gathering for the volunteers. Now the homes of nationalists were constantly being raided. Sometimes these raids often happened in the middle of the night. Uh, women were, uh, were, uh, were often harassed during these raids. Women were at the forefront. Some Sometimes the men were on their own. There may be no men at all in the house. And uh, w w w women suffered greatly at the hands of, of uh, the military. And uh, that's fairly well documented. And it's documented in a lot of witness statements. Then in 1921, then, there was an organisation set up known as the White Cross Organisation. And it was established and was mainly as a result of fundraising in the States. And it was established to distribute funds to people who had been left destitute as a result of the war situation in Ireland. Now, Company Man actually administered the White Cross funds and they did the groundwork and uh, the background work uh, for this. Now, they, they also sent food parcels to prisoners in jails uh, throughout Ireland and in the UK during the War of Independence. And the truce was declared in on the 11th of July 1921. And at the time of the truce, there was approximately a thousand branches of, maybe slightly more uh, branches of Cumberland across the country. We know that there was maybe close enough to 40 Cumberland members in prison at this time, at the time of the truce. Uh, we, 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 we know also that uh, that um, that uh, uh, there was sorry, as I said, there was a number of female prisoners, a number of common one prisoners, thirty to forty in prison at the time. Um, Countess Markovich uh, was one of those prisoners, and she was released. As she was a TD, and she was released uh, at the truce. Um, then, uh, as a result in, of the, the the treaty was signed in, as we know, in December. 1921, and in February, Common Man was one of the first organisations in, in the country to actually uh, vote against the treaty. And the votes as recorded are 419 votes against and 63 for the treaty. Uh, uh, and uh, it, that was in the kind of a national conference that was held in Dublin. Now, 
uh, we know that here in Cork City, uh, there was in excess of 20 branches of Cumberland across the city, and uh, uh, and uh, they, they voted about uh, two to one in favour of the treaty, which was uh, in contrast to what happened nationally. Now, some of the members of Cumberland who voted for the treaty, they left Cumberland at that stage and they formed an organisation called Cumberland or the Freedom Group. Um, now, we know as well uh, that, uh, that uh, some of the mo a number of moderates left, uh, left Cumberland uh, around this time. Now, there were six female TDs in the second hall and they were there and at the treaty vote all six right there was 100 percent of the female tds all six voted against the treaty and the six of them were countess markovich mrs pierce uh, mrs tom clark mary mcsweeney kato callahan and dr ed english now the kato callahan probably dr ed english are probably the least known of the six TDs there. So Kate O'Callaghan was born actually in Lizarda in County Cork. She was teacher by profession and went to work in Limerick. There she met a Michael O'Callaghan who was a businessman and they got married after some time. And um, uh, Michael O'Callaghan was the first nationalist Lord Mayor of Limerick. Uh, he was then replaced by a George Clancy. But then in March of 21, uh, but White Lock Allen and George Lancy were shot in, in their uh, in their houses, very similar to the date of Thomas McCartan in Cork, and it is uh, felt that they were shot by the RIC. Um, Dr. A.D. English then was uh, herself and Countess Markovic were the only two that uh, of the six uh, that nobody belonged to them had died in either 1916 <clears throat> or in the uh, or in the War of Independence. Dr. A.D. English was a doctor practicing psychiatry in in Banisloe in Mental Hospital, or what was known at the time as Banisloe Asylum. She was a member of Cumberland, and um, she was uh, was elected at all. And as I say, she opposed the treaty. After the end of the Civil War, Dr. A.D. English went back to Galway and went back to Banisloe and practiced there again as a doctor in, in the mental hospital in Banisloe. Or it was known at the time as the asylum in Banisloe. During the 30s and into the early 40s, she put a lot of pressure on the Fianna Fáil government to update and modernise the Mental Treatment Act. And she did a lot of background work for uh, what became the 1945 Mental Treatment Act. And the 45 Mental Treatment Act remained in power until the year 2001, which was replaced by a more modern act. Now, um, she was very vocal or very involved in in rights for patients with mental health issues. Um, in, in most of the mental hospitals or the asylums at that time, there would be there would have been a number of patients who probably had no relatives uh, belong to them, or had become totally estranged from their relatives. And when these people died, uh, there would often be probably nobody to claim their bodies. So they were buried in the local cemetery. So uh, the same happened in the workhouses. And uh, these local plots in the cemeteries were known as the Pauper's Plot, which was a terrible name. But that was the name that in the Ireland of the time. Now, Banislow had had such a plot in a local cemetery. And when the AD English knew that, uh, that her own health was failing, she uh, requested that rather than being buried with her family, she wanted to be buried with her patients in, the, in this local plot here, in the local cemetery. This will show you the social conscience that this woman had. And it is only in recent years that a local uh, young doctor uh, began to research and do research into AD English. Up to that, she was probably totally forgotten about in, in Irish history. Now, the Civil War then commenced in, in, um, in, on the 28th of June, 1922, and as was the shelling of the four courts was what the spectre really set it off, but it had been going for some time. Now, families were, uh, were split on both sides of the Civil War, and women were split on both sides, 
and we know that members of the Man, there were sisters on both sides. Now, Arthur Griffith died on the 12th of August 1922, and General Michael Collins was shot dead in Bain Le Blanc on the 22nd of August 22. We know that after the death of General Michael Collins that the Civil War became more bitter. And execution of IRA men who were, who were caught with arms began in late of 1922. Well, I would have to say here we know that there were four uh, executed in, on the 8th of December who, who hadn't been caught with arms as such and were before this legislation was brought in. But I won't get into that here. Now, a mass arrest of Kumanaman members also took place across the country in late 1922. We believe that there was in the region of 560, maybe 600 women imprisoned in Dublin during the Civil War, mainly in Kilmaine and Mount Joy and in the North Dublin Union. A lot of these were Kumanaman members, or the vast majority would have been Kumanaman members. We know that Cockta was somewhere in excess of 40 people, 40 uh, women, mainly coming among, were arrested here in, in County Cork. And if we look at West Cork, if we take in kind of McCroom and uh, West McCroom and Bellavorne as part of West Cork, there would have been in the region of 14 or 15 coming among members uh, who, uh, who whose names uh, uh, can, uh, that can be established that they were in Kilmaine in jail. We know that in the region of nine or ten of them came from Bantry alone. We also know that twenty odd women, uh, over twenty women, were uh, common uh, members were arrested in Kerry. Uh, we know that one batch of them that were were uh, arrested uh, were sent uh, on a cattle boat from Fiennes Pier to Dublin, and uh, this was probably because the railway lines were up at the time. Uh, but I read somewhere there where um, uh, the cargo actually stated cattle and women on the boat. Or not. I don't know if that's true or not, but I did read it in the publication. Now, we know that Kate O'Kellen and Mary McSweeney were arrested on their way to Liam Lynch's uh, funeral. And w when they uh, arrived in Kilmainham, they immediately went on hunger strike. They were hunger strikes as well by many of the other members of Cumberland as well. Um, so there was a decision made in uh, by uh, by uh, in Kilmainham that the prisoners, uh, the female prisoners, were going to be moved, and somewhere between seventy and eighty female prisoners were were to be moved in the first uh, tranche from Kilmainham jail to the North Dublin Union. But the women, many of the women, resisted and were uh, were unwilling. Uh, to, to go voluntary to the North Dublin Union. I think one of the reasons were that Kate O'Callaghan and Mary McSweeney were both on hunger strike and they didn't want to leave them. Um, they, they clung on to the balconies, they refused, uh, 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 and it, they had to be manhandled and lifted, and some of them were thrown down the stairs, many of them were battered and bruised, and a lot is written about this particular incident. Then in, in late 1923, uh, some of the female prisoners uh, were, were released. And by December 23, uh, I think the vast, I think practically all of them had been released by December 23. Countess Markovic remained on as the president of Common until about 1926. But when the Valera left Sinn Féin in 26, to start off Fianna Fáil, Countess Markovic joined them and she resigned as president of Cumann Oman. Now Cumann Oman uh, went into decline, and, but it remained on as an organisation. We know that in the 1970s it, it supported the provisional wing of the IRA, and in the year, year uh, 2014, uh, the centenary of its foundation in 1914 was marked by a ceremony in Windsor Hotel by members who, who claimed to be members of Cumann Oman. Uh, just to finish off, I would say that women suffered a lot in, in the War of Independence, uh, probably uh, a, 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 a lot of ordinary women, women in, in houses who were, uh, who were uh, harassed and ill-treated by the military. And I think a lot of their suffering uh, went, uh, hasn't been recorded. I am glad that in recent years an effort has been made to look at the role of women in the War of Independence and to, to, to look at the role that they made in gaining us the freedoms that we enjoy today.
Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Khan. Um, again, a very uh, uh, detailed, uh, maybe more global or uh, national look, I should say, at at um, at the role of women in in politics in that in that time and that era. So I I just like to sincerely thank Khan and, and Triona for their uh, for their time that they have in in putting this together. Um, as you can see, it is very detailed and. You know, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to, to gather all this together on a, on a voluntary basis. So um, thank you both very much for, for, for your efforts. Um, we certainly would be uh, like to take um, uh, a few questions or a, a few points. I, I know there's quite a lot got into the, into the chat box. Um, but like if anybody wants to uh, to put the ball rolling, um, by all means, just unmute themselves. Uh, we just take one at a time. And um, if somebody would like to to ask a question just while we browse through the, uh, the presentations. Can, can I just ask you uh, a question that you mentioned on, on the, it's amazing, I was just thinking, listening to your presentation and, and having listened to, to Triona's, when you see all of the, the efforts that the uh, Common the Man had locally here in Kilbritton, and then you, you think about it, they didn't even have a vote uh, at that stage, did they? Um, <clears throat> I, I suppose in the 1918 election was the first time that women got a vote in Ireland. There was a, a movement prior to that called the suffragette movement throughout Great Britain and Ireland fighting for, for the vote. A, a lot of women in, senses, in some of the senses, rather than putting down their occupation, they put down suffragette. And then uh, the RSA men who was, um, com who was taking the, the census back to the barrier, cast it out and put down housewife or secretary or whatever over it. So you would see in some of it. So this fight went on and in 1918, they were given a vote for the first time, but at the age of 30. Uh, and would mean at the age, but I was all, you had to have some property in that as well. But mean then at the age of 21, I had a vote. Now, moving in then, Sean, uh, to uh, the, election of 1922 was interesting because um, the, some of the uh, common one people, and in particular Countess Marriage, sought with Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith uh, to delay the election for maybe a month or two and to bring out a supplement, uh, supplementary um, reg, uh, register uh, to allow women at the age of 21 to have a vote. Now, at the time, the government, who were trying to get a state established, and were under uh, pressure from England to hold the election, felt that there wasn't time and that it couldn't be done. So in that election of 22, it was only women of 30 years of age or older could vote. So an awful lot of the common man people who were only, uh, who were younger and 30 had no vote. Now, what difference would I mean is probably minimal, you know, because there are probably only been a number of, a few thousand people in any case, but nevertheless, it must have been calling for the people who had fought so hard in the war of independence, who had taken fierce risks, and and, and that they were that they were disenfranchised. Now, in the election then of twenty three, the register had been modified, and women at the age of twenty one had a vote. So that's a, just a kind of a fact, and yeah. I find it sad in one way, you know. And and I, but again, I can understand the pressure uh, that the new government were under. They were under pressure by. Uh, but because the vote in twenty in June twenty two was regarded as a kind of a referendum on the treaty, and it was an important election. Now, maybe just to think for one moment as well about women being elected. There were six women in the second doll. Some of them lost their seats in 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 the twenty two election. Uh, now there were in in twenty three then uh, Margaret O'Driscoll, Michael Collins, the sister Margaret Collins O'Driscoll was elected to the doll. Kathleen Lynn was elected. But when it came up to 1927, there were only two women elected to the doll, and that was Countess Markovich and Margaret Collins O'Driscoll. Countess Markovich died before she could take her seat. So in 1927, there was only one female in Dahl Airden, and that 
in comparison to six uh, uh, six years earlier, you know, so, uh, and that was matter of Collins or Driscoll. So I think that society, and I don't, I don't blame the government of the day or I don't blame the church, I think society put these women back into the homes that took them out of their role in politics. And society just didn't vote for them. They weren't elected and there weren't all of them there. With even Mary Mix when you lost her seat in 27. So it will just tell you, I suppose maybe they were a bit extreme. They were on an extreme policy. But we went from six in 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 21. They are in 22, in the 22, the 21 election, and in, in the Dáil vote in 22, we went from six to one in 27. Okay, Kanye, th thank you very much. It's amazing how it, how it turned around. Um, I just see uh, see Dermot Begley there, Dermot, and I'm I'm I know I'm uh, maybe lending you in it, but we we did miss you at the last meeting due to a technical uh, mishap. So can I ask you if you if you'd like to maybe make a comment? I know your late father was was very involved, and um, what would uh, what would you have heard him say about the the local common man? Well, Sean. Yeah, we can hear you, Dermot. Thank you. Okay. Well, I cannot say enough about the common man in general, but the local common man, particularly the Kilbritton common man, like the Kilbritton volunteers, were one of the best common uh, in, in the country. And what they suffered, and I know what they suffered, and Trina has done a wonderful, wonderful um, job in in in. Uh, our presentation there, and I thank her very, very much indeed. Uh, I have discussed things with Trina, and uh, I told her she's more than welcome to drop over, and I'll show her some stuff that I have on the common amount. Now, I was lucky in so far as I knew an awful lot of them coming in to our business in Bandon long ago, while I was very young. By 1954, I had a um, 56, I beg your pardon. Uh, I had a huge interest in the War of Independence. I had read as much as was published, I think, at the time, uh, particularly the local uh, West Cork uh, um, involvement. And um, I met these people coming into the shop. Lovely, lovely people. Big, soft men that you couldn't imagine taking up uh, a rifle uh, against anybody. And um, I was lucky insofar as I think sometimes they may have thought I knew more than I did. So when I'd ask a question, I would get an answer. Um, <laughs> and eventually, uh, it was about 1956 really, when um, my father found that I had uh, read the books and that I had spoken to the, these people. It was then and only then that he said to me, uh, well, if you want to know something, ask me. Up to that, he felt that, well, he wouldn't tell me much because he thought I might go out boasting with my young teenage friends. He was probably right, God knows. But um, then, uh, now I have access and have had access for many, many years to all these papers, to all the common among papers. Um, and, and these are all going, I might tell, tell everybody here and now, they are all going to the Cork County Archives in the very, very near future. I've um, been through them all with both Trevor and my niece, Nola. And when we're finished, and everything will be online, and when we're finished, they will be in the county archives for anybody to, to uh, research. So okay. hopefully uh, that will happen in the next couple of months, in actual fact. Okay, Dermot, thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, Sean. And again, and again, apologies for uh, we... we, uh, we lost your sound at the last meeting and um i just i don't know if you you picked up on it but we really uh, wanted to thank yourself and, and the bigley family and your um 
and Trevor for the, the brilliant work that was done in the last presentation as well. So just in case you didn't hear us, we're, uh, we're taking this opportunity, dear. So thank you very much. Sean, can you hear me? Yes, indeed, Anya. Yep. It is, Anya Nicola, just a very quick point uh, to, about the women and the votes. I was only reminded of this the other day. Um, women did actually get the vote um, for local elections in the, the 1898, I think, Local Government Act. Now, I apologise, I don't have the detail about was there a property qualification or an age qualification, but um, they did. Uh, women did have the vote in that. And actually, I was reminded of the other day when, indirectly, my attention was brought to this Morris Dockrell, this, he's on the... Uh, uh, local government in Dublin uh, in this uh, Dunley or something, and he 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 said he he's the sixth generation of Dockrells, and his great great granddaughter, um, you know, she was a unionist woman. She um, uh, was elected to the to, in in Dublin, actually elected. So women did have the vote for local government, but I'm not sure what. Right. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. T thank you, Anya, for for that clarification. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, we we have um, as I said the the. The compliments on the chat box, I think, summarise the, the meeting. Um, they summarise the uh, the excellent acknowledgement and efforts that um, that have been put together in the presentations by by both Con and Triona. And um, you know, you've you've done uh, you've done the, the women of Ireland uh, a great a great um, a great justice. And um, it, it's, Sean, it's, it, it's, sorry. it's great that we sorry, have it, uh, it's great that we have uh, it on record now. Uh, going Shawnee, if I can come in for a moment, can we catch you, Sean? Yes, can, yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to ask Triona there, uh, uh, you know, the point there she's making about the peace of what we would call post-traumatic stress today, and even more traumatised, and, and uh, as they say, their own words suffer from shock. So mm -hmm. uh, I would like maybe, Triona, if you would come in on that point again, please. Well, yeah, Con, that, that really hit me from reading all the files. And I do want to say, actually, I just wanted to make the point, these, the, 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 the pension application files are available for everyone. Like, I don't know how anyone could be bored during lockdown because each of these women, these files are 90 pages and some of them have two or three files, you know, if they had to make um, an appeal. So they're all there online. But like what they talk about, like you can imagine the stress I, I'm driving around the parish with a completely different view. I, I'm just imagining, do you know, imagine being in a house and your brothers are gone, there's no one there to protect you and the black and tans could come at any moment, day or night. Um, and just the stress of that on a constant basis for that many years, like it had to have affected them. Seeing their, you know, their brothers dying, I think we saw Mary McGrath's um, um, I had a Declan Harrington give me a beautiful little piece from an autograph book um, that he found that he thinks was written from Jack to his sister. Like these weren't just random soldiers. They were, you know, their flesh and blood, their brothers. And they witnessed all this and they had to, you know, help carry the bodies. And that went on for years. So that that really struck me um, reading the files. But all those files are available, you know, the ones that meet um, pension applications. And I'm delighted like that Dermot Begley and Trevor and his niece are doing this great work. Um, you know, we'll really look forward to that. I also wanted to mention um, um, Shannon Ford is bringing out um, a book on the Kinsale coming a month. So that's on the horizon. So just to keep an eye out for that as well. Um, I'm not sure when it'll be when it'll be coming, but it, it, it should be out sometime soon. Okay, thank you, Triona. Uh, John, can I ask Triona a question? Paul O'Brien here. Yes, indeed, Paul, yep. I've been hunting for Lou Fitzgerald for over 60 years, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. When I was a boy, I was treated by a nurse in Cork. Right. My said she was Lou Fitzgerald. I always thought it was L-O-U, right? Yeah. She said she was in the common Amman, and she had a medal. She never got married. That, her, that, 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 that would be her um I, she, she has relatives my my aunt is it was married to her nephew i hope i'm getting that right um so they were from clash ray now was Lou, she, was she a nurse later she was she was and i could correct me if i'm wrong any of the fitzgeralds if they're there but uh, that family i think lou was a nurse she actually an application um, or sorry, she did, I think, but it's not available. Now, whether it 
it will come online in further releases. I'm not sure. I have tried many times to contact um, the military archives regarding that, but um, unfortunately, I, I didn't get any answer. Um, but I, I have. She's one of the ones that doesn't have a file online. But her sister as well is very was very involved um, with Ballin D, and can, she set up. Her sister set up Kinsale, and um, Shannon booked that. It's coming out. We'll 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 cover that. I'd say. That's but, um, she gave me many yeah. injections. That's why I remember her. Oh, that's lovely. I'd <laughs> like to say one other thing. A hi to Sean Kelleher. I think we're third cousins. Hi, Sean. Uh, we're both <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. That's, uh, um, that's actually sorry, Paul. On on just just on Lou Fitzgerald and in one of our history books, I'm not sure which edition. Um, I put in a little piece on the the Ireland's possible first flight. Um, they brought a sick brother home from the UK, and she's in. Um, she was one of the one of the sisters that it was the first charter flight, I think, to Ireland. So you'll see a picture of um, Lou there as well. That's fantastic. She was very good looking, I remember. But then <laughs> I was only a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Brilliant presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Paul. I hear Lig, I want to send greetings to my cousin in Toronto. <laughs> Paula Brian. It's a great honor to be your cousin, isn't it? I'm very honored to be your cousin. Vice versa, we will take the My mother often talked about your dad. <laughs> Uh, I just say we we will take the honor as the historical society for getting the two of you together. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Uh, anyone else like to uh, to ask any questions? Con, can I just come in? Um, yes, just a question is. there. Just like what effect would uh, the war period have had on the women in later life in terms of relationships that would have ended due to you know fatalities and possibly other relationships with other, um, other Well, relationships. definitely. I, I, I definitely do think that's the key. I, I sorry, I didn't have the stats on it um because I started doing them, but like they, they were very young. And well, I think it's um Hannah Barrett says like they joined, you know, they gave the in the best years of their life. The, very few of them were actually married. I think um um Willie Driscoll's grandmother was married and his grand aunt. They were probably the only two that were married during these years, you know, they were a little bit older. Um, and had children but like they gave the best years of their life and like Birdie Manning she says in hers she didn't progress her teaching career and she asked to leave the you know two or three times um, to resign her position because she was so busy and yeah. um, one of the files actually has a letter um, you know just I, I, I think that some of them probably didn't get married because you know, they gave they, in the, pri the prime years of their life, they were running around the country, you know, dispatching and and doing all, all the jobs for the coming demand. Like they really devoted their lives to his girls in Cork. There's a good percentage of them were not married, Dennis. Um, and I, I, I think probably this might be a reason why. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, they, 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 re they really gave it all. In, in, in your research country, did you come across it's like... Sorry, Tanya. Dennis, uh, just there, maybe on a personal note, as you mentioned there, some of them would have lost their partners. Uh, like we know, say, Sean Tracy was engaged to, uh, 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 was, uh, uh, was going to be married to a queen girl from, from Tipperary. She later married a Crowley man from Clannacilty because she lost her partner. And um, Min Ryan from Wexford, uh, if, we, if, if we look at Sean McDermott, his letter uh, before he was executed in 1916, and I think he only wrote one letter to his family, and he said, if I had lived, I would probably have married Miss Ryan. Miss Ryan was Min Ryan from Wexford. She was one of a very, very large family. Most of them are teachers, a brother, a doctor, a brother, a farmer. And she, um, she later married Richard Mulcahy. Uh, now, do I run anything about the Orion family from Wexford and the Wexford people did a very good article on there a couple of years ago. Uh, um, they were split in the Civil War, split them, split them. Some of, of the girls uh, were very, very anti, you know, Min Ryan, uh, 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 Min Ryan herself took the pro treaty side with her husband, Richard Mulcahy, and she was part of uh, communist Asia. And, but some of the girls uh, remain very anti treaty. And one, Nell Ryan, was uh, imprisoned in the North Dublin Union and she was on hunger strike and she was quite low and quite ill. So some of the sisters went uh, to Mrs. Mulcahy, to their sister, 
and saying, look, uh, do something to get her sister out of jail because she'll die. So uh, Richard Mulcahy said, by all means, I'll release her in the morning if she signs. Uh, uh, there was a, a kind of a, a thing that uh, a number team that he gave that I support the government. I would not oppose him. She refused. And in later life, she became a Fianna Fáil councillor. Her, one of her sisters married Sean T. Kelly, who was a Fianna Fáil TD and became a minister. Uh, he, that lady died, uh, I think, of probably of TV out in France. She was very bad chest problems. And her sister later married Sean T. Kelly when he was president, and she was his wife when he was president in 1950. We have here in West Cork, we had Charlie Hurley's girlfriend, uh, and would have, he probably would have been married to her. She later married Tom Barry. Or I, I, I could eight or ten people who married somebody else, you know, who lost the love of their life. I'll finish in one little story that I, I saw in, in Aid McCool's book, and it's no ordinary women. It's a lovely read, fantastic uh, amount of, of stuff in it. But she talks about this man, or this lady outside in America, never married, um, left Ireland. She was an aunt, she had a lot of nephews, a lot of nieces. She went to all the communions, she went to all the confirmations. No timid, quiet woman, elderly. And when she died, her nephew had the job of cleaning out her flat. So he went to her, her apartment and he started to try to shed a lot of little items and he put them all carefully into boxes. And when he went under the bed, he found a suitcase. And when he opened the suitcase, he found a heap of paper inside it. And some of the paper was thrown together in the form of a book. And it was a complete story of coming on in Dublin, the story of her life, the story of the event she was involved in. And he suddenly discovered up in the bed a completely different woman to the woman he knew. She had never spoken about the War of Independence. She had never spoken about the Civil War. And like that comes back to Triona's point. A lot of them are probably traumatised. They probably compartmentalised it. They probably put it away. But nevertheless, she wrote everything on paper and Sinead McCool laid hands on that and that was part. And Sinead McCool at the time was a, a, a guide in, in Kilmainham jail. So she had, so she has done a lot in the research. And I would say to people, there are three or four books out at the moment uh, on coming on and they're very good reads. But going back to their personal lives, a, a, a lot of them married someone else. Another one, of course, is Katie Kiernan who was engaged to Michael O'Connor. She married Felix Cronin afterwards. She called her, her second child, uh, Michael Collins Cronin. And I have a little bit here from the Irish Times on, on this January, where Michael, uh, Michael Collins Cronin died uh, in, in, uh, on the 5th of January. And I have a little bit about him here. And he talks about his mother, and he, he says that she went on to marry Army Officer Felix Cronin, a couple of two sons, Felix Jr., uh, who died in 2000, Michael. He says that the Kieran and Cronin marriage was not a happy union. She was obsessed. This is now from the Irish Times. She was obsessed with Collins' memory, a, a, a portrait of Collins on an easel dominated hallway of their home. And she chose a grave near his wife's silly young woman. Katie Kieran was only 52 and she died in 45. A disappointed and embittered woman born before the era of liberation and he suited the role of suburban housewife. Michael spoke glowingly of his father, less of his mother, although he understood her frustrations. Felix Cronin Sr. quit alcohol and was appointed to a state job by Shawnee Mess when he left the army, despite the strong civil war bitternesses that still existed. Michael spoke glowingly of the Mess and his generosity in providing badly needed employment to an old foe. Felix Senior, uh, that's, that was Katie Kiernan's husband, he made a deal with his son Michael. He would pay his way to UCD if he passed his exams and did not drink alcohol until he graduated with an educational degree. On the evening of his graduation, his father handed him five pounds to celebrate. Michael won a British uh, uh, service scholarship to Cambridge University and went to the Imperial College in Trinidad to study tropical agriculture. After graduating, he spent two years working in Nigeria as an agricultural advisor. Returning to Ireland, he managed a company called Potash and Continental. A keen sports, uh, sportsman, he played rugby for Newbridge College, Cambridge University, and St. Mary's RFC in Dublin, a contemporary in the playing field by Julie O'Connor. And then he goes on to say where he lived, and this is written by a Michael O'Regan, 
and it, it is off at the Irish Times on the 1st of the 3rd, 21. But that will just tell you some of their lives must have been very difficult. Their love of their life was killed. They got, uh, maybe some of them married again, some of them didn't marry. It, and I, I think maybe for the winter, I might try and do an article on seven or eight or nine of them, because I think they're, you know, it is a little spark in me, you know, and those kind of notes there, you know, they're real life people who suffered fierce tragedies. Okay, Con, uh, thank you very much. Anybody else to, uh, I think the, the chat box is predominantly uh, complimentary of, uh, of the two presenters. Um, there are no questions in it. So if that's, um, if that's all, I'm going to, uh, to uh, close Can up. Can I give them a, a quick word, Cahirlig? Uh, Just yes, a quick uh, word sure. in conclusion. Yeah, yeah you can indeed. Yeah. I think we'll never, we can, we'll never appreciate fully the part played by the coming man in the fight for Irish freedom. They were extraordinary women, and I think that um, without them, the, the, the volunteers wouldn't have had the amount of success that they had. In fact, many of them wouldn't have survived. They were extraordinarily successful. I'm very glad that Diemer is making his records available to, in, in the local authority. That, that would be making a big difference. My, my own aunt, for example, Ellie uh, uh, Kelleher, Eli Kelleher, who's here in Bandon, um, was, uh, had a few narrow escapes when she had ammunition and, and out near the Brinney with um, in, in a pony and cart. And they, they, she had a few uh, little um, bags of messages, bread showing up. And they looked into the cart and they saw the bread. And <laughs> underneath was something, if, she, if, they, if they had found it, she'd have been in real trouble. So there were some very tight escapes. But the, the part that they played, that the women played, is, 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 is it's not recognized fully throughout the country. And, it's, it's great. I must commend you on, on, on having such a program as this because it, it will make people aware of, of what, what they did in a whole lot of different ways, the way they helped the volunteers. They were, in, in many ways, they were, they were, they were matching the vol volunteers in many of the things they did and the support that they gave. To, we, can never, we can never thank them enough. It, it's, and, and many of them, some of them weren't members of Common Amman and they, they have, they, they, a lot of their work has gone unnoticed and unknown. And some of them did it anonymously, but they, they really, they were really a huge force. And the British, as, as, as was pointed out in that excellent talk, that Percival and company acknowledged that what, what they had done and the amount, the amount of intelligence work that they did and the support that they gave the volunteers, giving them their beds very often and feeding them and seeing after them. And doing tremendous work, and some of them even, even, even in, in some places, even took, took guns as well. They were able to use guns as well, if necessary. So we can never thank them enough. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, Kahiri. Thank you indeed, John. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you to everybody for attending. And um, I'd again like to give a special thanks to Khan and Triona for their, for their time. Uh, I'm sure it's... Uh, you can take a, a sigh of relief at this stage um, after those days and weeks of, uh, of getting it together. Um, just on a little bit of housekeeping, we are proposing to do another uh, Zoom meeting in May. Um, and after that, we will be hopeful of maybe getting out to do something again, but obviously to be agreed. So um, on the 31st of May, we have a Zoom presentation on the Monday night again, um, just on, uh, there are two, two presentations. Um, the first one is on Dermot Hurley, who was a second cousin of Charlie Hurley's, born also in Barley, and maybe better known as the Gaffer Hurley. He was, um, he was uh, an OC in the East Cork Division um, and, and was shot there. And the second presentation is on Con Murphy, uh, who was shot at Clownderine in Kilbritton, who was a lieut lieutenant um, from Clash Fluck in Timaleague, and uh, he was shot at, uh, at Clownderine. So we have that on the 31st of May. We will be sending out the links as usual. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody that has joined the society. We have got a tremendous response since we went online. Um, you can log on to the uh, www.kilbritton historical society website and there is an option there to uh, to join the society 
for 20 euros for an individual for the year. It just helps us to cover our costs with uh, the Zoom presentations and that. Uh, and I say, again, I thank those that have joined because we've got a significant increase in numbers, but uh, we'd, always, uh, we'd always welcome more to, to join. So again, uh, thank you very much. And we look forward to, uh, to, uh, to seeing you at the next meeting. Thank you indeed. All right.